Hello, and a very warm welcome to this Cell and Gene Therapy Insights webinar, a case study on streamlining AAB titer determination using variable path length technology. I'm Charlotte Barker, an editor at BioInsights, and joining me today are two experts who will discuss a new method for AAB titer determination using real-time monitoring, which eliminates the current dependency on offline testing and the associated variability caused by sample manipulation. First, we'll have the presentation, followed by a Q&A discussion. As always, do feel free to ask a question anytime throughout the event using the Ask a Question box, and we'll try to get to it during the session. If you're interested in more information on the topic discussed today, please take a look at the Resources tab where you can find some documents to download. So now, I'll introduce our presenters. First up, we have Joe Ferriello, who's Director at Line Bioanalytics Bio Applications at Replogen. He's been with the company for more than 20 years with over, over 10 years of development and validation experience in analytical applications. He specializes in UV analysis and leads the development and commercialization of high value products and flexible solutions that address critical steps in the production of biologics. Joining him, him today is Dr. Yan Chen, who's a principal scientist in downstream process development in gene therapy at PTC Therapeutics. He has more than 14 years of experience in the biologics field and he's worked at several biotech and pharmaceutical companies and developed purification processes for biologics, including monoclonal antibodies, recombinant proteins, and viral vectors. His expertise includes downstream process development for early and late stage programs, technology transfer, and process characterization. And with that, I'll hand over to Joe to start today's presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Joe Ferriolo. I'm the director of Atline Bioanalytics Applications with Replogen. Partner Jan Chen and I will be presenting a case study for streamlining AAV titer determination using variable path length technology today. We'll be talking about our analytical solution, the challenges, the limitations, provide a brief introduction to variable path length technology, or as we call it, VPT, and slope spectroscopy. And finally, we'll end with PTC Therapeutics case study for AAV titer determination using our variable path length technology. The Solo VPE and Flow VPX are the analytical solutions provided by Replogen. We use these devices across multiple platforms, and in use for multiple applications from protein concentration to mRNA, oleonucleotides, and a variety of different gene therapy applications. Today, we're going to be talking about how to implement this technology for AAV viral titer concentration. We're first going to start where the device can be used. Specifically, we're going to be focusing on samples collected post UFDF for purified material. Our goal is to reduce the amount of cycles, reduce the amount of raw material required, and accelerate the time to market by providing a very quick analytical measurement to make real-time decisions. In doing this, it is our hope that in-process testing required in every step in the process can be done quickly, accurately, repeatedly, and limit the amount of cost used for detecting viral titer concentration using the current techniques available in the market. Here are the most currently used methods for AAV quantitative analysis. They would include qPCR and ELISA, DDPCR and ELISA, AUC, and TEM. Unfortunately, most acceptable tolerance ranges with these current techniques are anywhere between plus or minus 20 to 40%. Additionally, the time to results is quite substantial, ranging from one day potentially to weeks. And that doesn't include the cost of the analysis. Our goal using slope spectroscopy is not necessarily to replace any of these techniques. It's to implement an analytical technique when a very quick comparable result is required at any stage of the purification process in order to give you confidence of the titer at that stage and allow for continued processing. I'm now going to provide a quick introduction to VPT and slope spectroscopy method itself. 
our platform is a UV based technology. However, we're doing two things differently here. One is we're not relying on a fixed pass length cell seen represented on the graph on the left, where the concentration has to change in order to fit the measurements linearity within the sample of the measurement. The solar VPE is still a UV based technology. We are doing two things different in the operation of the technique. One, we're not relying on a fixed path length to make any sample measurement. As you can see represented in the graph on the left, the cell remains the fixed path length and the concentration must change depending on how dilute or concentrated the sample is. We vary the light of detection ranging from our light source being a fiber optic component called a fibrette, where the light emits from the bottom of the fiber to the bottom of the detector where the sample vessel sits resident. We will adjust this path length in order to find the best linear range to start acquiring data. The second most important piece of slope spectroscopy is we are not relying on a single absorbance value to calculate concentration or OD. We are taking multiple data points within the measurement to plot a slope regression. This allows us to assign R square values to the regression line to show how accurate the value is. Each spectra that you see represented in the bottom graph is an additional path length of data. We can then section these spectral graphs to create the slope regressions you see in the top right. The slope will replace the absolute absorbance value commonly used for most traditional UV methods. This is how the Solo VPE or Flow VPX guarantee linear results based off an R squared value of three nines or higher. We've effectively been able to take this method into a pass-fail criteria based off this three nines criteria for slope regressions. So our approach remains that the sample remain resident in neat form where no dilution is required and purely rely on the change of absorbance over path length in order to detect accurate linear slope regressions. The way that the software will collect the data is that fibrette will lower itself into the vessel and set a zero path length. And from the bottom of the vessel, start scanning from small path lengths to large path lengths until it finds about one absorbance. It will then collect 10 different path lengths down to collect the slope regression. The software is completely automated. It doesn't need to be programmed with the path length range or path length step. Path length choices are from five micron up to 15 millimeter and as small as a five micron step. So essentially the device has 3000 choices of path lengths to find your linear regression data. And it takes less than one minute for data acquisition. The, the equation we're using at the bottom simply removes absolute absorbance and path length from the beer lambert's law and now Concentration is performed by slope equaling the extinction coefficient over concentration. Our Viper AAV application software has evolved where we have an automated solution for calculating viral titer. The graph on the left represents all the method details that will be required for data collection. As we know, two wavelengths being for the DNA and the protein need to be established for the ratio collection that will take place. There are four extinction coefficients required to calculate the viral titer concentration. The extinction coefficients were taken directly from the Eric Somers paper that notes both extinction coefficients for the capsid as well as the protein DNA. The user would be responsible for inputting the extinction coefficient for the 260 DNA. This would come from the molecular weight or by inputting the DNA sequence directly into the software to calculate the extinction coefficient. Once these pieces of information are added, it, it is a one minute test until your results are seen on screen. 
The middle graph represents the genome titer concentration, capsid concentration, the percent full, and the R value. The R value is the ratio of these wavelengths. This effectively becomes your OD value for which all the math will be calculated. We also have a sequence input for determining extinction coefficients using a DNA sequence. These are commonly found on the web. We have integrated one directly into the software to make your method development easier. So to summarize, we've now taken traditional UV from a seven-step operation down to a two-step operation of measure report. We remove or automate multiple steps in this process. The game time to results ensure that robustness and simplicity are built directly into the method and improve the workflow and ease of validation for slope spectroscopy methods. Slope spectroscopy has been used in biologic manufacturing for over a decade now. We wanted to point out a couple of different applications that are most commonly used throughout the industry to give assurance that this is not a new technique that's being introduced into the industry. It's been used for quite some time to establish robust methods, getting away from traditional fixed path length UV methods and over to a more technologically advanced variable path length technique. Our goal is process alignment. The more labs that start using a platform such as Solo VPE or Flow VPX ensure that the integrity of the method are followed all the way through each process step. We look at this as a platform of analytics throughout the bioprocess industry, ranging from quality control back all the way through process development and potentially research and development to align across different companies, sites, contract manufacturers within the industry. I'm now going to hand this over to Yan Chen, Principal Scientist of Downstream Process Development for PTC Therapeutics. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction to the wearable path lens technology for AV titer determination. In my part of the talk, I've given uh, some case studies for the technology usage in downstream AV process development. Here's an outline of my part of the talk. First, I'll give an introduction to PTC therapeutics and its gene therapy portfolio. And next, I'll get into why we started the evaluation of the OP system and the outcome of the evaluation, and followed by some case studies in downstream process development. And uh, we'll finish up by summary and question and answer sessions. PDC is headquartered in South Plainfield, New Jersey, and our gene therapy center of excellence is located in Hopewell, New Jersey. And with integrated space for process development, testing, and GMP manufacturing for plasmid DA and uh, AAV wetter products. PDC has a diversified platform for research and it drives the strong portfolio. Uh, we have six commercial products right now and uh, five of them are uh, small molecule medicines and uh, we have to have one gene therapy product that's currently on the market, which is Upstaza. It is an AV2 based gene therapy uh, for the treatment of ADC deficient, and it has just been approved by the European Commission in July 2022. This is significant for uh, the patients because it brings the much needed treatment to the patients in need, and this is also important for the greater um, gene therapy community because this is only the fourth in vivo gene therapy product that has ever been approved by the regulatory agencies. In addition to the APPS data, and the, we have other gene therapy candidates in the pipeline, and our process development team, uh, along with other teams, are racing against time to try to bring these um, candidates through research and clinical stage and to bring them to the patients as soon as possible. Adeno associated virus or AV based viral vectors has become a popular platform for gene therapy. And uh, currently there are several hundred clinical trials going on in the world. 
here shown is the typical AV purification process flow at industrial scale. Uh, when AV is produced in the upstream cell culture, it goes through cell lysis and clarification step, followed by capture chromatography, either affinity chromatography or ion exchange chromatography. Following capture step, usually it will go through a polishing step uh, with either ion exchange chromatography or some other chromatography steps. This step is important because uh, during the upstream process, uh, generally there are mixed populations of AAV produced, including full capsids, empty capsids, and partial capsids. The full capsids are the AAV particles that contain the full length therapeutic gene of interest, or GY. The empty capsids are the AAV particles that doesn't contain any DNA sequence. And the partial AV particles are the uh, AV particles that contain a partial piece of the GOI or whole cell DNA or plasmid DNA. So in this step, usually the full capsids are separated from the empty capsids and partial capsids to obtain a pure population of AV product. After the polishing step, the purified AV is going through a ultra filtration and diffiltration step. In this step, the AV is contributed to a certain concentration and diffiltered into a formulation or pre-formulation buffer. And uh, it will be followed by fill and finish and become the drug product. The goal of the process development team is to produce a robust and scalable purification process to produce the uh, AV uh, in a pure and uh, effective form. So we have to look at many different process parameters and uh, the range for these parameters are important to ensure uh, we meet the specifications of the critical quality attributes. Some of the main critical quality attributes we frequently track during process development including AAV genome titer and the capsid titer, as well as the full empty capsid ratio. Currently, our in-house AAV pure quantification methods include qPCR and DDPCR for the genome titer determination and capsid ELISA for the capsid titer determination. These are industry uh, standard uh, testing methods, but the drawback of these methods are the turnaround time can be between one day, two weeks, due to the complexity, complexity of these methods and also the backlog of the testing lab. When replicating approach us and introduce us to the solo OEP with the wearable test pass length technology for AAV titer determination as an interim analytical method for quick and simple AAV titer measurement, we became interested since this method takes less than five minutes per sample and it's a direct measurement. We quickly set up an appointment with the RepGene team and the RepGene team uh, came on site and help us set up the method and also me measured uh, some in-process samples, uh, which include affinity illusion, polishing illusion, and some intermediates from the TFF step. During the initial assessment, uh, we measured the, the genome title using the COP method and compare those values to the genome title we obtained by the QPCR method. And the log 10% difference is less than 7.4%. Also look at the capsid title uh, from two methods, named the solo VP versus the ELISA method, and the percent log 10 difference is less than 4%. The initial assessment is quite successful and uh, the solo VP data showed good agreement with the QPC and CAPSID ELISA data. Next, we look at the accuracy of the solo VP method. We measured more in-process in process samples from the downstream process development and uh, we measured the uh, genome title using the solo VP and compare it to the genome title from the QPC method and it shows a great linear agreement with R square of 0.9842. Looking at the capsid title, also it showed a greater linear agreement between the solo VP data versus the capsid ELISA data with the R square equals 0 
Next, we look at the linearity of the slow VP method. Uh, in this experiment, we started from a concentrated AV sample and made some dilutions from it. And the slow VP data, either by genome titer or CAPSI titer, were compared uh, to the expected qPCR and CAPSI ELIDA titer from the dilutions. And we found there's a great linear relationship between the two values. And with R square equals 0 0.9999 for the genome titer and uh, R square equals to one for the CAPSI titer. The qPCR genome titer range we tested in this experiment is between 4.7 E plus 11 to 2.6 E plus 13 with G per ml. And the capsid ELISA titer we tested during this experiment is between 2.9 E plus 12 to 1.6 E plus 14 capsid per ml. Next, we look at the repeatability of the SOLUP method. Uh, the two AAV samples were measured in triplicates using the same fabret and the same adequate sample within the same sample vessel. We look at the slope to 60 and slope to 80 value and the percent RSD is less than 0.2% for both measurements, which is excellent. Next, we look at the intermediate precision of the pseudo-VP method and the the AV sample was measured by two scientists on different days using different fabrets, sample vessels, and adequates. And the slope to 60 and slope to 80 value again had the very, very small RSD with less than 1%. After establishing the accuracy, linearity, repeatability, and the intermediate position of the solo VP web method, we were more comfortable with the method. And uh, we started to look at the potential applications in AAV downstream process development. Here shown are some ex examples from the affinity chromatography development. And uh, this specifically is for a loading capacity study for the affinity chromatography. Traditionally, for downstream scientists, when we do a loading capacity study, you really will load a large amount of loading material onto the column then we'll collect the flow through from the column and in very small fractions. And then we'll send many of the fractions for assay testing. And uh, because there's there's large amount of sample and the potential backlog from the testing lab, uh, when we get the result, it can take one to two weeks. Uh, one way we try to get around that is by using the solo P technology and we'll set up several uh, experiments with different loading volume. And uh, then we'll collect the uh, illusion pool and measure the solo VP wetter titer from the illusion pool and then calculate the AV we recovered during the illusion. And here's shown uh, an example of two experiments. This one, we loaded 1x volume of the load material and the next one, we loaded 3x of the load material and the AV we recovered from the illusion pool had the 3x increase, which is corresponding to the load volume increase. So this means that we haven't reached the maximum loading capacity of this column with the, the higher loading. So basically we can go even higher loading until we are falling out of the linear relationship of the increase in the AV recovered to the increase in the load volume. Some other potential applications for affinity chromatography for the solo UV method include resonance time study, buffer additive study, and illusion buffer pH study. Solo VP can also be used in the polishing chromatography. The example shown here is the illusion buffer conductivity screening study. Uh, this is an overlay of the illusion peaks from three different screening rounds. And uh, we measured the illusion pool from these three different rounds for both the wetter titer. And with that, we calculate the recovery from these rounds. And we also measured the full capsid percentage, uh, percentage from these three different rounds. And based on the recovery and full capsid enrichment from three different rounds, we can decide which buffer condition is the best for our purpose, either better full capsid enrichment or a better recovery or the balance between recovery and full capsid enrichment. 
And from that, we can go quickly to the next cycle of process development. Some other potential application we, we see for the usage of SLOP in polishing step include the resin screening, buffer additive screening, loading capacity, resin time, loading pH conductivity, elution buffer pH conductivity, and grading step elution studies. Last but not least, I'll highlight the solo VP application in the UFDF process. In this step, the purified AV usually is country to certain concentration, then buffer exchange to a formulation or pre-formulation buffer. It is important to have in-process control for this uh, step because we don't want to under concentrate or over concentrate the product during the process. Also, we want to monitor the product tighter during the process so that we don't have unexpected product loss during the process and also after recovery. In this experiment, we measured the genome titer using LVP method for the starting material, as well as three other samples during either during the concentration step or the final product. And then we calculated the concentration factor using the genome titer from the using the solo VP method. The concentration factor is also calculated using the volume reduction during the process. And we can see that the concentration factor calculated using both methods, they are in very great, very good agreement. This shows that the solo VP method can be used as an UFDF in process control method. In summary, AV process development requires a fast and reliable method for vector titer and capsid titer measurement. Solo VP data have shown comparable results with QPCR titer and capsid ELISA titer on purified samples. Evaluation of the technology demonstrates good accuracy, linearity, repeatability, and intermediate precision. Case studies demonstrated its application in AV affinity and polishing chromatography, as well as in UFDF process. We think solo VP technology with the wearable pass lens technology is a good interim method for atline AAV titer and full capsid percentage determination for quick decision making in downstream process development. I would like to thank my colleagues at PTC Therapeutics, Jabi Zen, who is a junior scientist in my lab, who has tested a lot of samples and did large quantity of data analysis for this project. And I would also like to thank Inho, who is the director of downstream process development gene therapy group and who has been instru instrumental in guiding us throughout the evaluation. And I would also like to thank our rapid gene colleagues who have been helping us tremendously during the initial setup evaluation and troubleshooting during the assessment and also for collaboration on the publication of the white paper and for making this webinar happen. Thank you all, and we would like to take some questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you, Joe. Great presentation. So we're going to move on to the Q&A now. Um, if you do have a burning question for Joe or Jan about uh, either their presentations or any of the topics raised, uh, you can submit that via the Ask a Question box. Um, it's helpful if you let me know who you'd like to direct the question to as well. Brilliant. So let's get some questions. Let's see. Right. So the first question uh, that we've got here: um, How comparable are the results from the solo VPE compared to industry standards? Joe, do you want to take that one? Sure. So um, I actually uh, like the way that you've worded this question, uh, Jeffrey. So um, I look at it almost as the, there's two industry standards. There's the uh, you know, obviously the QPCR and ELISA, or DDPCR and ELISA uh, technique itself, um, and then um, the material um, that is uh, we found over the last uh, year uh, that qualifies as reference material, being an actual standard, a physical standard uh, volume uh, that comes with a COA that you can actually reference against. Um, what we found when we were comparing uh, the slope spectroscopy technique to any of the four methods being used 
we were always within the tolerance of the technique being used, which is, as we mentioned, unfortunately pretty high, right? You're talking anywhere from plus or minus, you know, 20 to 40 percent, you know, when you include the ELISA in, in the technique. So um, we ended up being comparable to all of that. Um, the only thing we can absolutely guarantee is we're going to be faster. We are certainly going to be more repeatable and more linear, but it's still a challenge to really assess accuracy related to any type of gold standard when we're talking, you know, about 20 to 40 percent differences in techniques. So that is something that certainly Jan and I are still very curious to explore to understand is there, a, you know, a more accurate technique that can do better than plus or minus 40 percent? Absolutely. Uh, next question I've got here, how accurate does extinction coefficient need to be? How accurate does the extinction coefficient need to be? Does it have to be experimentally determined or is it okay to use a theoretical value? Uh, Jan, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. It is a great question. Um, I think if your AAV is a, a like wild type AAV, uh, uh, yeah, you can pr pr uh, pretty much use the AAV uh, extension coefficients that's published in summer paper um, because all the wild type AAVs they have capsids that's uh, highly conserved and uh, it the difference between different serotypes of the uh, extinction coefficient can be less than 5% based on the uh, serotype. But if you have uh, um, AAV that's completely different than the current AAV serotypes, uh, you probably, if you know the sequence, uh, protein sequence, you can use some online tools to calculate the uh, AAV extinction uh, coefficients and compare, compare to the value that's in the summer paper, if it's not too much difference, you, it shouldn't uh, affect too much of the accuracy of the results. But uh, if uh, it is very different, it, it, it's better to use the uh, your new calculated uh, extinction coefficient to try to get a more accurate result because the calculation of the titers it has a lot to do with the uh, coefficient you use. Brilliant. Thank you, Yan. Great answer. Um, another question I've got here, have you ever used this method to measure titers in affinity chromatography load? Um, could you use this method to measure titer in clarified harvest, for example? Joe, do you want to start us on that one? I'm going to give that over to Jan, because he probably has more experience than I do with that question. Uh, yeah, thank you, Joe. Yeah, I'll take that question. Um, so we have not used uh, the solo VP method to measure AV titer in the harvest because uh, solo VP is uh, um, A260 and A280 absorbance based uh, UV method, and it will uh, measure any uh, signal that this can be given by whole cell protein or whole cell DNA. Um, it doesn't distinguish where the signal comes from. So in the crude uh, cell culture harvest, there's uh, a lot of uh, whole cell protein and whole cell DNA that can interfere the, uh, with the accuracy of the results. So I wouldn't use solo P method to measure the AV titer in the crude cell culture harvest. Yeah, it can it can be used after chromatography. So again, mm -hmm. any purified material we're happy to take. But you know, I'll just add one more comment to that because I think I see the question lower down. Yeah, it's the same reason why we can't do you know, partial, uh, you, you know, to, because the UV, any UV technique, um, it's just not the right tool for that, right? So it can't tell between partial DNA or DNA, it just sees DNA. So, and, and that's not specific to, to solo VPE or slow spectroscopy, that's, that's a UV issue. Brilliant. And, uh, Question here was well, a two-part question, but I think we'll do them one at a time. So, how much sample do you need for the measurement? What should be the minimum minimum volume and tighter value to um, to be able to get reliable data? Uh, who'd like to answer that one? Sure. 
the volume is uh, between 60 and 100 microliters of sample. However, uh, slope spectroscopy is not a destructive technology, so you can retain your sample after measurement. Brilliant. And the second question is, what is the success of this technique for in-process samples where impurity levels could be significant um, versus purified vectors? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, Jan's data that were shown in the presentation were in-process samples, and it did quite well compared to the former technique we were comparing it against. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to Joe's answer. Uh, so I think uh, if you use uh, after the affinity step, uh, you, you, you measure the sample with the affinity purified sample or even uh, further purified polishing sample, the impurity levels should be minimal, and uh, it's, um, the solubility is pretty accurate uh, if you do round-to-round -round comparisons. But uh, if you um, capture your uh, AEV using an um, ion exchange chromatography, you may have significant uh, impurities, so the uh, reading may not be very accurate. So, so it depends on your method of purification and which in-process sample you measure. Great, thank you. And for 260 nanometer EC, is the value required for full capsid with DNA in it or only DNA? Can you elaborate more on the EC values uh, which need to be inputted in the software? Yeah, I don't know if you yeah so that is the, e the extension coefficient at 260 for the DNA is um, the only value that we don't pre-populate in the software for the calculation because we do know um, that it changes on the depending on the product that you're testing so that's why we have the calculator tool built into the software for you to add your sequence uh, to calculate that value for a more accurate result we did find that the other uh, wavelengths for the protein the values listed in those papers did not change significantly, um, even when different concentrations or different serotypes were tested. So to be very clear, this method is not serotype dependent. It works on all the serotypes. Um, I, I will jump ahead to one other question I saw below because I, I know this is gonna be potentially asked again if we're looking at other, other viruses. The answer is yes, we are. Um, however, um, some of them, like let's just go with Lenti, for example, um, in order for the, a UV method to work, you need extinction coefficients. And there are no currently published extinction coefficients for Lenti, at least we can find. So um, what we're trying to do is we can certainly make the measurement based off you know, the information you do have. However, if we're trying to really make this into a UV-based method, that still has to be proven out. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Is the capsid type uh, AAV specific or intact capsid specific? Jan, you want to take that one? Mm. Sure, yeah, I'll try. Um, AAV specific. So it uh, depends on the extinction coefficient uh, you use for the for the capsid or AAV specifically you are using with. Um, if the, it's a um, traditional or um, wild type AAV you are working with, so it shouldn't be AAV specific. Um, but if you are working with a normal capsid and it's uh, this protein sequence and coefficient you are using is different than the AAV, or different by a lot uh, with the traditional um, AAVs. So that might be capsid dependent or specific. Perfect, thank you. And has the solo VPE linearity been verified for genome titers below 4.7 to the 11 uh, VG per mil? And uh, if yes, what was the lowest limit of quantification, um, Joe? 
Sure. Um, yes, it has. Um, we've gone as low as uh, 2.0 e to the 11. Um, we would go no lower with the current technology. Um, it's higher. I mean, obviously, you know, I know titers would never get that high, but higher is never an issue. I mean, it, it's, you know, we have plenty of, of linear range. Um, realistically, um, as you saw in the presentation, um, anything below that range I mentioned for E to the 11, you just can't acquire robust linear data. The signal is too weak and there's no representative change of absorbance over path length. So we can't guarantee the accuracy of the measurement once we get below E to the 11. So that's why we're capping it at that point. Makes sense. And also probably one for you, Joe. Um, for the Elliott Titer measurement, can solo VPE be used for samples with completely unknown Titer values? Um, Sure. So, I mean, if you're literally walking up to the system with a, a blind sample, can we provide you a ratio value? So, what we call the R value? Yes. However, if you're looking to do anything like, you know, uh, calculate uh, VG over ML, then you would have to have your DNA sequence available. I mean, there's just no way to do it without. However, based on the ratio value, a few of our customers are looking at making decisions based off uh, multiple lots of material just based on the ratio alone, meaning that if they're um, looking at uh, formulating, um, make up a number, 10 different batches of material, what they can do then based on just the ratio alone without any extinction coefficients, they would then pool lots together of similar ratio values and then send that larger lot out for analysis. So the goal being, rather than paying and waiting for 10 lots, you might only have to send two to three lots out, depending on how closely aligned your ratio values are. Excellent, thank you. And, um, and how would you find the extinction coefficient for AAV? Um, the viewer says, uh, this is needed before using the solo VP. How would you find the extinction coefficient? Yeah, so we're again we're we're using existing publications that have been out in the world for ages at this point. Um, I believe we're linking the Somers paper to this uh, presentation on the web. Um, that is our primary source for three out of the four extinction coefficients that we use, and then obviously for the second one we're going to uh, rely on you to provide your molecular weight or DNA sequence. Brilliant. And another one for you, Joe. Uh, what is the minimum DNA concentration I can measure with the solo VP? Uh, I, I would ask, I guess, the if we're, if we're talking viral viral titer in the in the sort of spirit of the uh the presentation it would be that um you know eat and nothing less than e to 11 so eat 11 and higher okay brilliant i think jan is having some uh having a little trouble with his audio so um i'll ask you another one joe um, no problem is the, is the solar vp system and software fully gmp compliant uh, how are the system and software qualified and what type of support is provided for qualification? Sure. So um, our primary business is in the GMP environment, even though we are we are very adamant in this presentation that we are not trying to replace any of the current techniques that are being used. We're just offering a better analytic tool during the process to make quicker decisions and save time and money. Um, with that said, we always plan for the future. All of our applications uh, using slow spectroscopy have the capability of the software being 21 part 11 compliant. Uh, we offer software validation services and work with the users to make sure that specific needs are met by their IT groups to make sure that we can give a tailored uh, configuration for the software setup and also make sure that we are compliant within the regulation. Brilliant, thank you, Joe. 
And uh, Jan, do we have you back? Not just yet. <laughs> okay, That's okay, you can you keep going. That's fine. Yeah, I'll ask you another one, Joe. Um, how long does it usually take for the Solo VP system to be installed and validated um, for PD work? Sure. Um, what I could tell you is that uh, Repligen won't be the bottleneck in this. So most of the time spent during validation is actually waiting for our customers to um, schedule the installation, the training, and if a project demand is available, um, typically the more access we have to work with the scientist, the quicker this happens. So I would say most method development and validation are typically done within six to 12 months. However, there have been cases where we've dramatically improved those timeframes depending on how much access we have to working with all of you um, and the current project demand. Brilliant. And Joe, can you please talk a little bit about the validation process and validation support that Repligen provides? So our application specialists have all been trained to work directly with the scientists in helping develop a robust method for whatever application you're working with slope spectroscopy and also assist in the design of experiments and the standard operating procedures that would follow in releasing the method uh, for use uh, in the lab. So our involvement is not just basic user training. It's really assisting with the heavy lifting that's required to define parameters for the method development and then successfully implement the test to validate the method for release. Brilliant. I think we do have uh, Jan back now, I think. Jan, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Um, I've got a question for you here. Can the solo VP method be used to measure the titers of different AAV serotypes? Yes, yeah, it definitely can be used to measure the titers of different AAV serotypes. Uh, so based on uh, the, uh, the uh, AAV sequences, um, so the, the capsid protein sequences, they are very conserved between the wild type different uh, different wild type serotypes. Uh, so definitely you can use the efficient coefficient provided in the summer paper uh, for the little VP measurement. But if you have a normal AV serotype um, that it, and the uh, protein sequence is much different than the wild type, then you may uh, be able to calculate the extinction coefficient and use uh, according to your need. Brilliant. And um, back to Joe for a minute. Um, can the can the solo VP be used to test incoming plasmid product as raw material to check purity levels? As long as it's purified material, the answer is yes. Okay. So again, the the serotype doesn't make a difference. UV doesn't care about which serotype is being tested. So again, it's you know, that's more related to like a plasmid purity, which, which we do all the time. So um, that basic ratio divided by extinction coefficients, you know, or even just looking at the ratio number alone, where I know traditionally we're looking at, you know, a, a range of slope from 1.8 to 2.0. Um, that's already been done for multiple years. We have papers and publications already on our website noting that. So if you go to the application section, um, it's separated out by application and you can download the content to see what we've done with our customers. Brilliant. And uh, Jan, what are the limitations of the solo VPE method for AAV titer measurement, would you say? Yeah. So, I mean, I've told you, I mean, obviously, you know, the webinar is telling you how great this all is. So, um, you know, where where we are still looking to improve, honestly, is volume. Um, we would love to reduce the volume further than what we have now. Um, so I, certainly I would want Jan to chime in on his experience, but I think from our side, that's where we're focusing in on. Uh, sure, Joe, yeah, uh, I'll chime in. Uh, so since the solo VP system is the UV-based method, uh, anything that can interfere with the absorbance at uh, two, 260 and 280 nanometer, 
may potentially affect the accuracy of the results. So if you have an ex excipient that can interfere with the uh, absorbance or you have high levels of impurity, uh, including whole cell protein and nucleic acids in your sample, uh, it definitely will affect the assay results uh, from the solar P reading. Uh, and secondly, uh, it does not distinguish uh, full capsids from partial capsids since it does not uh, distinguish uh, specific DNA sequences. So that's the uh, limitations we see from the evaluation. Brilliant. And now we've got you back, Jan, and you got rid of that echo. Um, I've got a few more questions for you. Um, first up, can the solar VP method replace current standard AV titer assays? Yeah. Oh, oh, hi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think, yeah, this, 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 uh, whether you can use solo VP method to replace current uh, standard AV titer assay or not, this really depends on each company's needs and their own method evaluation and validation. I think in certain instances, uh, such as uh, for the in process control of the final TFF step, it has the great potential to replace the traditional assays. Um, and due to its speed and accuracy. But for other steps, uh, we are, uh, it, again, it depends on each company's uh, needs and its evaluation and validation. And uh, for us, we are not looking to replace other standard assays during normal in-process uh, sample testing, but mainly would use it as the uh, uh, complementary method for round-to-round -round comparison during process development to speed up our uh, development timeline. Brilliant. Thank you, Yann. And another one for you um, relating to the Viper software. Um, what does the R value in the Viper software measure and what can users use that for? Okay, sure, yeah. The R value is the uh, ratio between the slope to 60 and slope to 80 uh, from the total VP uh, reading. And this value can be used to estimate the full capsid percentage in an AV process sample you just measured. And uh, you can use the equation in the summer paper, which is provided uh, in, in the reference from this webinar. And uh, using that equation, you can use this R value to uh, get a rough estimate of how much uh, full capsid percentage you have in your sample. Brilliant. And uh, next up, I've got quite a, quite a long question, so bear with me. Um, while comparing and evaluating the empty capsid of AAV with respect to virulent form, does the optical density measurement give values which would be different as per the variant and GOI um, in terms of distinction coefficient or those of slope spectroscopy values? That's a really good question. So um, I would say um, we, have, we have not seen differences, okay? And I think that's primarily because um, usually the, the DNA contribution is the star in the ratio measurement, right? And that certainly the the, the protein wavelengths have slope, um, obviously, and, and the, there is contribution from the capsid. But in comparison to the DNA, we just have not seen a significant change. Those, and I think as more as you as you read the Somers paper, that is how we've all arrived at our confidence level that um, those values don't necessarily change on a scale that's going to make a significant difference in the result itself. So I think one of the other questions was something said, you know, like a, maybe a two to 5% difference depending on the entire range of concentrations, which in the scheme of, again, uh, EC determination for um, all four wavelengths um, doesn't really impact the, the, the sample as much. Brilliant, thank you, Jay. And does this type analysis require the use of the Viper software, or can it be performed with the legacy software from CTEC? Jan, sure. I'll, 
Would I even say that? Yeah, I'll 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 take this one. Um, look, uh, our Viper platform software is sort of our next generation software. Um, can can both measurements uh, technically be done? Yes. However, I would say the older version of software makes it a lot more cumbersome and challenging for the scientists just to get the results because none there's no automation in that software. The view that I showed in the slides is the new platform, which again, in less than a minute, you have all of your data collected and the software has done the calculations for you. So that would not be possible in the older version of software. Great. I think we've got time for maybe one, one more question. Um, let's see what we've got here. Does the method need to be qualified for in-process samples or is only DS qualification um, okay to use? Yeah, I, I can take that question. Um, so I, for us, we didn't uh, qualify the method um, for in-process sample measurement because we are using it uh, for round-to-round -round comparison and we, we see the trend and it's uh, pretty much uh, in alignment with the trend we see using other traditional assay methods. And uh, But it also, again, it depends on the requirements from each company and your needs and uh, uh, how do you see it. Yeah, that's my answer. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Jan and Joe, for answering those questions. Um, that is all we've got time for today. But any questions that we didn't get to, we will do our best to reply to those by email. So I hope you get an answer anyway. Um, just to remind you once more about the resources in the resources tab, do check those out if you'd like more information about the topics that we've covered today. The webinar will be available on demand tomorrow, so look out for an email from us with the link. And I think all that's left is to thank Joe and Jan again for a great presentation. And thank you to the audience for listening. We hope you'll join us again soon.